Yep, I'm Ariella Friedman. I'm also one of the um, incoming chiefs, <coughs> gold chief, and um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and um, I'm originally from New York. I went to undergrad at University of uh, Pennsylvania, and I did my um, medical school studies at um, Cornell and uh, my internship there year, uh, year there as well. And I'll be um, going into pediatric urology, hopefully. So I'll be um, also presenting a case presentation. This was a case of a 53-year-old woman who um, had um, end-stage renal disease and had had um, due to uh, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis when she was a child. She had undergone um, two deceased donor renal transplants um, in her earlier years, and now she was presenting at the age of 53 with gross hematuria and recurrent UTI. She first saw um, urology in November 2010, and at the time had a cystoscopy, which demonstrated, um, a, which resulted in a biopsy that uh, demonstrated squamous cell carcinoma uh, without muscularis propria present. So she was uh, re-biopsied in the operating room and found to have a high-grade PT1 disease as well as CIS. Um, at that time, she, um, you know, it, consideration was given to the fact that she was immunosuppressed. And um, while BCG would have been preferred, given, given that status, it was opted instead to treat her with mitomycin C, um, which she um, underwent induction in several rounds of maintenance mitomycin C treatment um, over the course of the next year. Um, before I go on, I was, I was wondering if you've had any um, experience treating immunosuppressed patients with uh, intravascular BCG therapy. Very difficult. We tend to avoid it. You know, recently we had a patient uh, with HIV and TB, and you, you just can't uh, give them BCG. The risk of causing harm is much more than doing good. Mm -hmm. If these patients have aggressive tumors and need intravisidal treatment, then I tend to do a modified uh, DSTASI regime whereby the mycomycin C is driven by antibodies mm -hmm. without the BCG. So as I mentioned, she was treated with several rounds of mitomycin C, and um, over the the next year, she had abnormal lesions that were biopsied, but then uh, subsequently developed additional gross hematuria, which resulted in a in a cystoscopy that demonstrated a large tumor growing uh, throughout most of her trigone that was exuding a, a whitish exudate and a nearby area concerning for CIS. So she underwent repeat biopsy at that time and was found to have muscle invasive um, high-grade transitional cell carcinoma. And so just to um, touch more on her past medical history, as I mentioned, she um, had two um, renal transplants for end-stage renal disease from post-streptococcal uh, glomerulonephritis. Um, one was in 1982 on the right. That one had subsequently lost function, which resulted in a second cadaveric renal transplant um, about 10 years prior to presentation. Um, she was on regular Im immunosuppression as well as um, other medications for other medical comorbidities. Um, she had a, a small um, pack, uh, smoking history and had a benign exam except for um, surgical scars uh, from her prior transplants. Um, before I go on again, so, you know, we decided she had muscle invasive um, uh, urethral, uh, urethelial carcinoma and um, consideration would generally be for a cystectomy. And I was wondering if you've had, um, if you've had any patients in your experience where you've done cystectomy on renal transplant patients. I haven't done cystectomy on renal transplant patients, but I've certainly, along with Ben Chalicom, who was mentioned earlier, uh, done robotic cross-cystectomy on a couple of renal transplants. I haven't done a cystectomy. Um, before we proceeded to surgery, we just um, did some imaging, which demonstrated some uh, bladder wall thickening. Um, there was no transplant uh, hydronephrosis, but there was um, some hydronephrosis of her right native kidney. She had a negative chest x-ray and all indications that she had no metastatic disease. And so we had um, several considerations for her procedure. Uh, we, because of her comorbidities, she underwent preoperative uh, risk stratification with cardiology and was um, deemed to be low risk for surgery. Um, in consideration of her uh, uh, reimplantation of her transplant ureter, um, one of the considerations was that it was a short ureter, and would that be a factor in our operative planning? Um, additionally, the type of diversion was a consideration. We favored ileal conduit over a neobladder in order to minimize the potential for complications um, without necessarily precluding the um, conversion to a neobladder in the future if the patient should so desire. 
and then uh, finally, given the anatomy of where the transplant lay in relation to um, the pelvic vasculature and lymph nodes, we um, opted against pelvic lymphadenectomy in order to avoid pelvic vessel scarring. And I'll just demonstrate that here. That would be um, kind of the general uh, distribution for, um, for nodal spread from the bladder. And you can see on this um, image, although I only have one kidney there, imagine she has one on the similar side. It, you know, we did not want to do um, extensive dissection around those vessels and risk failure of her, um, tra of her functioning transplant. And so um, we did cystoscopy. So we started the procedure. What we wanted to do first was identify the transplant ureter. Um, we performed cystoscopy and placed a ureteral catheter um, within the ureter for the transplant, um, and that was found at the dome. And then um, we also proceeded to um, clip off the non-functioning ureter, the ureters for the non-functioning kidneys. And on the bottom left would be, if you're facing the patient's pelvis, basically the left ureter, a native ureter, the right native ureter, and the right transplant ureters were all uh, found and ligated. And then, I don't know that this is going to work. So. And, that's unfortunate because that was going to be the video for, um, for the transplant. Um, but anyway, so this is the start of the video. This is just dissecting in order to find the ureter. Uh, what we did was we um, lo located the obliterated umbilical vesicle, dissected beyond that, and then um, and then the transplant <coughs> um, ureter could be seen. Um, going into the bladder. Unfortunately, it's not such a long transplant ureter. And so in order to achieve maximal length, what we did was um, we cut it right at the bladder neck. And in order to do so, we were unable to clip the, um, the ureter because, you know, that was felt to, that it would have compromised on ureteral length. And so we, we, we cut that at the level of the bladder neck and oversewed the bladder with um, some VLOC uh, absorbable suture. Um, the urethra was dissected down to the external urethral orifice. Um, uh, she additionally had a supracervical hysterectomy um, with the uh, uh, with, gynecolo with gynecology oncology facilitating that, and it was decided to do an ileal loop conduit with uh, care to make sure that the transplant ureter um, adequately reached the loop without being placed on too much tension. And this was closed over a single J stent. Postoperatively, she did well. Um, she. Uh, uh, transplant immunology was on board, uh, tra uh, was, uh, transplant was on board in order to reinstate her immunosuppressive medication. She was monitored and sick overnight, um, discharged home um, on post-op day six and had some a reasonably good post-operative course with a little serous drainage and a, and a brief admission for ileus subsequently, which resolved with conservative measures. Um, and so I'll just, and her pathology revealed um, a posterior wall high-grade urothelial carcinoma, which extended into the perivescal fat and to the peritoneal surface. It had a maximum diameter of three and a half centimeters. Um, angiolymphatic invasion was identified. Uh, there was one node present, which was negative, and she had negative margins for PT3A um, and zero MX disease. And so I'll just talk briefly about uh, urothelial carcinoma after renal transplant and about malignancy in renal transplant patients otherwise, unless anyone had um, any questions up until this point. Did you uh, consider, uh, did you discuss chemotherapy and what are your views about chemo and the renal transplant? We did discuss chemotherapy, but felt that the primary, uh, the best option for her would be surgical excision. Um, and, and that's just due to the aggressiveness of the disease. Um, while we felt this to be localized, we felt this was the best option. We did not discuss that. I don't think we decided uh, on preoperative chemotherapy for a faster dressing for neoadjuvant therapy. Yep. Yeah, I don't, I, don't know that, I don't know how. I tried finding record of that. I couldn't see a meeting. We did. Yeah, okay. Yeah. She was turned down. Yeah. yeah. Because of the we had her kidney transplant. Sure. She had a functioning uh, kidney yeah. transplant. Because the risk of, we had to be a cis based protocol, and, and they thought that that was a challenge. We actually talked uh, about taking the kidney out yeah. and treating the protocol. Uh, yeah. And that was good enough. I think correct decision. Yeah. Well, if, if we didn't kill her on the operating table. <laughs> you can, uh, can you? Can, if you offer chemotherapy, can we offer carboplatin-based chemotherapy, which is less uh, toxic than the cisplatin chemotherapy? Oh, and, and less effective. You know, the Birmingham study had not come out uh, at that point. In fact, I don't know that our medical archives have read the Birmingham 
In fact, I don't know that any one of you has read the book. But uh, it, you know, it was felt at the time we saw her that the only effective chemotherapy was platinum base, and that the other thing was, was not. It's like he was talking about the capsaicin, <laughs> the, the plastic bottle leaching. The, so, 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 both both these patients, I did my best not to operate on them. Just in general, uh, malignancy after uh, transplantation of any sort is a common concern. As patients with transplantation are living longer, it's, it occurs with about three, and a half, uh, three to five times an incidence of the, of the general population, and it's estimated that by 20 years, about 50% will go on to develop some sort of malignancy. And the etiology of this is several fold. One is that you have impaired immune surveillance as patients are put on immunosuppression in order to reject in order to prevent rejection. There's also a chronic antigen stimulation from the graft. There's reactivation of latent oncoviruses, which play important roles in certain tumor pathology. And then there's a theorized carcinogenesis of the immunosuppressive re regimen. And then I also allude to the fact that um, um, in patients that have transplants, their cancers tend to be more aggressive. They tend to start with um, after a shorter duration, um, after a short duration, and they have significantly decreased survival rates um, compared with um, compared with uh, non-transplant patients, and that's even controlling for comorbidities. Um, the most frequent uh, cancers in a non-transplant population are not necessarily seen with increased frequency in the transplant population, largely because transplant patients tend to be younger, and it's different mechanisms that are um, contributing to oncogenesis. Um, what's interesting is that there is a a wide geographic variety in the types of tumors that develop in transplantation. So for example, in China, most of the tumors that develop in transplant patients are in fact um, urethral carcinoma, and so, um, and that's deemed to be due to a number of epidemiological factors uh, or environmental factors between um, ingestion of herbs and uh, underground water sources containing arsenic as well as a host of local endemic oncogenic viruses. And so in that population with a high coincident um, um, appearance of uh, upper tract uh, urethral carcinoma, they have a high incidence of prophylactic nephrouterectomy, which is not, the, not what we do typically in Western uh, countries otherwise, but just interesting. In other, in other countries, um, other cancers predominate. In America, the, uh, the primary tumor that develops is lymphoma and non-melanomanous skin cancer, and then tumors of the urinary system are the next most common tumors that develop in uh, transplant patients. With respect to renal transplant specifically, the overall rate for developing malignancy um, is about upwards of, up of about up to 11 percent. Although again, you know, with patients living longer, that might increase. Two thirds of um, the the general urinary malignancies that occur in renal transplant patients are in fact renal cell carcinoma, and that relates to a bunch of different factors, likely relating to their dialysis. Um, and the highest risk for developing post-transplant malignancy are those transplanted at age less than 20. And so, and that was when she received her first transplant. And um, it tends to be quite lethal, uh, their malignancies, as I mentioned. Within um, renal transplant patients, uh, urethral carcinoma is the most common uh, uh, cancer of the bladder. Um, there's a very low incidence in the West compared to um, compared to, as I mentioned, in China. And the onset uh, ranges widely in when it occurs, although um, typically about five years post-transplant is when most of these cases are reported. Um, they, these patients tend to have multiple relapsing tumors, more aggressive pathology with higher incidence of invasiveness, and um, it's not quite clear how their course um, progresses. They can either be de novo or um, recurrent tumors in patients that had previously um, had um, a tumor, but then, you know, had uh, had uh, no evidence of disease for a few years prior to transplant and then um, could potentially relapse. The largest um, and most recent series of uh, renal transplant patients that had had uh, urethral carcinoma actually came from VJU, fortunately for us, um, <laughs> and in general, but it was, it was a great study. It was um, a multi-center uh, study of about 1,600 patients in Britain that had undergone renal transplant. Um, they found an incidence of 0.73% subsequently going on to develop TCC, eight of which were de novo and four of which represented recurrence. Um, among the, I'll just hit the highlights of this, but among those with grade three, two-thirds eventually, two -thirds eventually died of their metastatic disease. Um, but those that had um, low-grade superficial disease, none went on to pro uh, progress to um, invasive, muscle-invasive high-grade disease. 
Um, and the five-year survival for these patients was 83%, 10-year survival was 72%. Um, when they reviewed the literature of, of the uh, overall before their paper, they had found among 21 case series, only about 136 patients in the entire literature that had urothelial carcinoma after a renal transplant. Most of these were high grade, and 60% of these came from China and Taiwan. Um, in diagnosing these patients, hematuria will be the most common presenting symptom um, for a GU malignancy. There's a questionable merit of cytology in this setting, um, but those who have had a prior history of TCC require a close follow-up, and uh, there's a recommended disease-free interval of two years prior to transplantation. Um, there's a question as to whether or not immunosuppression plays a role in the development of urothelial carcinoma. There have been case reports of those on cyclosporin or cyclophosphamide specifically um, possibly being associated with um, development of cancer, and patients on those immunosuppressive medications um, have been reported to um, develop their cancers with a short latency time than those not on those medications, although others have found conflicting results. And um, the mechanisms of action are such that they cause local inflammation at the bladder, and that might be um, a mechanism by which they go on to develop um, cellular degeneration to malignancy, although that's far from proven. Um, some advocate switching the um, an immunosuppressive regimen upon diagnosis to serolimus, which might have antiproliferative activities, but um, is associated with impaired tissue healing, which might complicate um, doing major surgeries on these patients. Um, but the extent of uh, the, the exact role of immunosuppressive medications in these patients and whether or not they need to be adjusted is unknown. But obviously, the management should be tailored to the patient's comorbidities and extent of disease. Um, in managing superficial disease, there, as we mentioned, uh, BCG is controversial. Um, generally, it produces immune reactions by a number of, it's believed to, to act by um, inducing the immune system by a number of different mechanisms, um, which then prompt it to, um, address, to, um, to attack the cancer cells or to, um, to, do, to, to, um, to cause that other mechanisms that, um, that, um, that kill cancer cells. But um, it may not be effective in transplant patients because um, immunosuppression may inhibit the mechanisms, mechanisms whereby um, BCG uh, induces the immune system. And there's also concern for a possible uh, tuberculoid reaction, which is why a lot of people are skeptical about using um, uh, BCG for these patients. However, there was one um, case series of patients that had undergone BCG treatment, and they were found to have um, no complications from infection, and the success rate in treating it varied, although the, um, I guess importantly, it, if there are no complications, it might be worth considering. One caveat, though, is that um, pr uh, while rifampin and INH may be um, used in order to help reduce local symptoms, they um, might interfere with the metabolism of um, immunosuppressive medications, and so um, if, can, if administering BCG, one might think to work closely with the transplant team in order to make sure that um, immunosuppressive medications are not interfering with uh, transplant function. Um, and there is evidence that in these patients there might be some um, local immune reaction. That's been found when these patients have subsequently undergone cystectomy in the case where their disease has advanced. There's been evidence of granuloma form formation um, implicating some sort of immune activity. Uh, for muscle invasive disease, um, radical cystectomy and bladder reconstruction is the standard of care um, in general. Um, there's been report of good maintenance of graft function when um, it's been done, um, but as I alluded to, if lateral lymph node dissection may be challenging and sometimes um, is forsaken. Um, uh, and concomitant nephrouterectomy might be considered in situations where upper tract disease might be more likely, such as analgesic nephropathy related end stage renal disease and in local endemic areas. Um, finally, I'll just uh, touch briefly on uh, what type of diversion to do. Um, while some say that, you know, uh, ileal, ileal loop is less prone to complications, which is true, um, some have advocated orthotopic neobladders because they typically have lower ur urinary tract infection rates, and the pelvic location might facilitate anastomosis to a shortened ureter. Um, how, and when it's been done, it's been um, associated with good maintenance of uh, continence uh, and stable kidney function. However, there is a risk of allograft reflux nephropathy, and uh, with a high pressure um, voiding for a continent um, type of procedure, one worries about developing a high pressure whereby infected urine might um, reflux back to a transplant kidney, causing um, reflux-type nephropathy. 
um, systemic infection, and ultimately graft loss. Um, so in conclusion, urothelial carcinoma um, and many malignancies in general are increased after renal transplant with um, varying geography, although a consistently more aggressive course. Um, the ability for us to practice evidence-based medicine with respect to these patients is limited because most of the reports are in case series, um, offering them low, low levels of evidence, but there may be a role for immunomodulation and BCG usage and optical surgical management while unknown. Um, there are many different management options that allow for preservation of renal function within the allograft. Thank you. I actually am in favor of uh, prophylactic nephr uh, nephrectomies uh, in some of these patients. Uh, we have done a number of laparoscopic nephrectomies, some bilateral to a gel port in the middle, uh, in patients who have gone on to develop tumors in their native kidneys. Uh, and I think the Chinese colleagues are not far off the truth. Uh, these uh, kidneys left in situ are tumorogenic. The risk is very high. Uh, and I think given the slightest uh, uh, sniff of the problem, uh, the native kidneys are best removed. As far as I know, this is the first minimally invasive cystic in somebody with the kidney. Certainly, somebody with Right. I just don't feel that I don't feel comfortable going with the uh, 